Coming up on Influencing Entrepreneurs. So I was a single mom through college. And I think that was also a force behind me. Uh, being, you know, a caregiver and a provider for another human being uh, and not wanting to fall into that like statistic of just being like, okay, well now I've dropped out of school and I'm pregnant. Like that's not gonna be me. I'm more I'm so much more than that and I can be more than that. After years of teaching entrepreneurship and consulting with multiple companies, I realized that when business leaders share stories of not only their successes, but their mistakes, it had a huge impact in the classroom. So I thought, why not document those stories? On this episode of Influencing Entrepreneurs, we'll hear from Meredith Connolly. Meredith is a local artist who illuminates her installations to further connect and submerge viewers into the environments she creates. Her work can be seen all over Charlotte as well as in her online store, Ash and Ochre. I'm Kazmer Ward, and this is Influencing Entrepreneurs. Well, Meredith, thank, thanks for sitting down with me. Uh, I, we're gonna, I wanna really hear about your background as an artist. I'm gonna be honest with you. My, I have an ulterior motive for meeting with you today. So my oldest boy is an art major at App State. Unbelievably talented, and you know he's kind of still fighting his form, but I'm trying to say, you know, how are you going to monetize this? You know, what type of line of work? He's looking into graphic design. Right. He also, uh, he's 20 years old. So people are like, hey, I'll give you $500 for a commission. He's like, eh, I really don't want to waste my Saturday. And <laughs> so I'm gonna, this interview is really set for you to help me yell at him more so I can okay. show this to him later. And he understands that, oh, I can make a, a decent living uh, doing this. Right. But really, wh where did you start? Where did art start playing a major part in your life? Uh, I've always been a maker and creative, and so I think that's very integrated into um, just my childhood, and, um, it, and from there it snowballed. I think when it really started to become prevalent, it was in my teens, and I did an internship with a metal artist, and I saw he was very successful. Um, he was making a living at it, and that was something that, you know, is not talked about in the art world. I think that typically it's, you get that, that stigma of you're like the starving, struggling artist and, and that's, that's how you live as an artist. So um, I think a lot of times people are typically naysayers when you go into those creative fields because of that. Uh, so he was someone that I saw that was, um, his name is Doug Campbell. And, and, and he, how old are you at the point? I'm 16. Yeah, it's 16. At 16. Uh, and so I was taking a sculpture class through high school. Uh, and, you know, my teacher was like, oh, you know, make, uh, you know, something that fits into the size of a box that is small. And I think I took it and ran with it and came in with a metal fountain. And I think at that point she, she was like, oh, this might be something that's, you know, really more up your alley. From there, um, I took more of a non-traditional path. I moved to Paris when I was 17 on my own. Uh, and so that was so kind for of- For any in particular reason? I, uh, it's kind of a really interesting story. So my kind of like stepfather figure at the time, he's in international business and, um, he, we had this conversation over dinner, like if you could live anywhere in the world, where would you live? And I said, Paris, because of the art there. I wanna be with the art. I, it, and it's so funny looking back because at that point, it's like, oh, you would think I would realize I'm an artist, but I, it, I didn't at the time. And so I took language classes. I took an internship that was more of a business-based internship, um, AKA filing lots of files. Um, and then uh, I would go to museums. Uh, I, d I studied, I brought my sketchbooks, and I really went on. Um, this I'm is in like, Paris? This is in Paris. So real quick, we kind yeah. of fast forwarded through yeah. some stuff. Your, 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 your stepfather asks you um, if you could live anywhere, you answer France, like, does he just drop you off at the airport? Or like, <laughs> like it, it, does uh, something lead to that once you've identified it that you actually um, get on a I plane? I mean, it really was a bit like getting dropped off at the airport. I mean, there was, you know, I, I started researching apartments and I, you know, came to him and I was like, I really, you know, I, this conversation was really impactful. Is there a way that we can actually do this? I uh, talked with my parents about it and him and, um, from there, it really was just within 
I don't know, four months I was, I was there. Were you still in high school? I was. So that was a little complicated and that's where, you know, you hear about people's accomplishments along the way and they don't talk about the things that are a little bit different. So like I, I dropped out of high school. I left school and moved to France. Um, and then when I returned, um, I went ahead and got uh, my high school equivalency and went right on to college. So for me, the, col the collegiate path was a little different. Like most people do that traditional um, route and it, it served me well. I think for me and the field that I'm now in, uh, it was the right decision. I have a 17 year old now. Would I recommend that for her? No, uh, but for me and my life, it, it worked out well. What's going on at that point to where you have the con? I mean, because dropping out of high school, we're, we, we're raised to think like, oh my gosh, you know, yeah. Well, that there's shame associated with it, yeah. right? Like it's not something that, uh, you know, for years, I w it's not something that I would talk about or it was like, okay, well, we can just kind of leave that part out because I went to college and I have these other um, accomplishments. But I think it's actually, when I look back now, it's a really key part of um, me understanding my role in in business and, and in life and the path that I wanted to go and that where I was at the time, even at 17, it didn't align with what I wanted to do. And um, and I think, you know, at that point, I, I would even tell my parents I want to be an artist. Um, and I think the biggest thing, um, like if I could give your your, your son or, or other artists advice is, is really finding mentors and voices and people that have made a successful career out of that and um, in order to make sure that you're kind of having those benchmarks to move forward with that in a successful way. So at, at, at that age, when you moved to France to be an artist, what does being an artist look like at that age? <laughs> um, exploration and studying and, and really... Those are the things you're doing, but in your mind, you know, are you like, I will have a studio and be oh, famous? Oh, no, or... no. Um, for me, it really was about living and really experiencing. So even at that point, it was um, an opportunity to see firsthand the work. Um, so I was going into museums, I mean, at least every other day. And I would even take the Louvre by section because it's a very overwhelming space. Uh, so for me, it was a very systematic going in, really reading about the work, looking at it, um, and then also, realizing like these are successful individuals these are artists that have have made it and not all of them um were quote unquote successful during their lifetime i was going to say yeah that a lot of the right. success we assume that they never they, got to see like van gogh sold yeah. one painting to his brother theo that's it yeah you know um so that you know at that point i wasn't maybe as advanced in thinking in that way but it really was examining visually i'm a visual person that's i think i mean visually what um what worked within the the art pieces themselves. So it was almost like this daily critique and and learning in art history that happened naturally to me. For You're me. kind of almost making a commitment at that point if all you do is sell your one painting to your cousin Theo, <laughs> that <laughs> you're okay with that. I think at that age it is. It's the rose-colored glasses age though, right. right? Where you're just so passionate. Like I was so passionate. It was so invigorated and um, you know, you at that age, you don't have it all figured out, but I think that's okay. So yeah, at that point for me in that moment, that was the baby step, right? And I was still in a place where I was creating uh, work, but not sharing it. And so that's also something that I, I paid a lot of attention to. It's like, all right, well, how do I build the confidence because that really is a confidence and vulnerability space to be in to take it to the level where I'm prepared to put this out here so the um, at this point are you are do you have any outside support or are you feeding yourself at this point I've out uh, like monetarily being yeah. there yeah outside support um, so my again my step father at the time, uh, I had a budget, which again was a really good thing for, for them to do. Um, they paid for my rent and then I had a budget and some money through my internship. So I was able to, to do that in that way. Um, it was modest and I <laughs> I laugh about it now because then I got a little schemey and so I had a, an extra like 
living room space in my, my flat in Paris and it had a pull out sofa. And so I rented it to one of my friends just to have some extra cash so I could travel. So you invented Airbnb? Basically. Yeah, yeah, okay. And I'm the yeah, I'm the un yeah, unsolicited founder of that. So yeah. <laughs> so uh, so you come back to the States. Yes. Yeah. Uh, which is good. honestly reverse culture shock, I'm sure. Yeah. Uh, coming back. How do how do you pick up from there and make the decision to go straight into college? Uh, it gets it gets a little rocky there for me. Um, I was, you know, at that point 18 years old and I tried to go back into high school first that was not <laughs> that was not conducive to after living on your own and, and experiencing something like that it's almost like you know your my whole world had opened up and then going back to a smaller high school in North Carolina didn't align um, nobody relates to you at this point. Well, and I just I didn't relate to them I feel like I you just mature I matured so right. much and I didn't feel like I had a couple of really close friends but um, I just felt like it was, again, so not like, so then I dropped out again <laughs> and went, I went to a community college and I also at the time, um, got pregnant with my first daughter. So I was a single mom through college. So at 18, uh, yeah. So I had her a week after my 19th birthday. Yeah. Um, and I think that was also a force behind me, um, uh, being, you know, a caregiver and a provider for another human being. Uh, and not wanting to fall into that like statistic of just being like, okay, well now I've dropped out of school and I'm pregnant. Like that's not going to be me. I'm more. I'm so much more than that, and I can be more than that. And so I um, I started going back to school on my lunch break. So I would take like one class on my lunch break. Um, I worked three jobs, like really gritty jobs, like cleaning houses, changing diapers at daycare. I was the perfume spritzer at Belk. Like I did all the things. Um, and I think that each of those jobs um, helped mold me as a professional. And I think that that's something I, I want people to realize as well is like, don't discount the small jobs that you do along the way to get to where you are. You can pick up critical skills from every single opportunity that you have. Um, so yeah, it took me seven years. So I, I paid my way through college. I, I, so I went to community college for two years. Uh, well longer than two years, <laughs> you get the point. And then I transferred to UNC Wilmington and it was there that I declared my major as an artist. So I went in thinking I was gonna go into psychology, still making art the whole time. So with those three jobs, I'm assuming yeah. none of them were artistically based? Or no. <laughs> you're, you're, not being, you're not thriving creatively. I, I think I, with the daycare preschool teacher job, that was, a, that was like an opportunity to have some creativity with the kids. Um, so that was probably one area where I felt what like- What does that I could... look like? I mean, being able to not only be creative with a group of children, but kind of spark, you know, inspiration. Oh, I loved it. They're yeah. so free. Uh -huh. And I think that that's something that was really fun to observe and, and have conversation because they're so open and they're, um, you know, they're not overthinking the process. It's the act of making like, you know, Picasso even talks about that. Like you, he said, he says he spent his whole, his whole career just trying to get back to that state. Right. I mean, Picasso is a whole other story, right, yeah. <laughs> but <laughs> that was one good thing that he, he said there. Um, so I think that for me, that was, again, those little pieces of the puzzle of like thinking about process and, and what it looks like for people and what people feel like as they're creating and then is the product you know, the ultimate and most important thing. I don't know. I think the process for me is far more intentional and interesting. So outside of the preschool, what, when do you get a chance to make money being creative? So um, a lot of it was really investment and time. So I would, you know, I did a, a couple of installations. I did one at a student show that I won a prize um, that was a small, you know, prize fee and then you get to put that on your artist resume. Um, another way was... And, and if you don't mind me asking, yeah. what does a prize fee look like? Um, well, it depends on the, the show and it depends on the art call, but I mean, it can be anywhere from $100 to $100,000 and it depends on, you know, being selected. That's called a juried show and so you have to submit your work. There are jurors or experts in the field. They vary in numbers from one to 10 depending on 
And, and from your there, students show what, what's where on the scale does that slide? <laughs> <laughs> the low end, like I think a hundred dollars, probably. Hundred dollars. Yeah, like if so, that. <laughs> so number yeah. one, it probably was the best two hundred dollars or a couple hundred dollars. Oh my gosh! Made, right. Well, it was funny because my prof I wasn't going to put anything in that show, mm -hmm. and my professor at the time encouraged me. I had created a piece um, that was already in. I, so I do a lot of illuminated artwork. That's the work that I do. Um, and it was already incorporating lighting in even at that stage. And so she said, you should really just put it in, just give it a try. It's really phenomenal. Do it. And so on a whim I did, um, and I won best in show. And I think at that point for me, there was a validation piece of, wow, I, I put myself out there and in order for me to be successful, I have to show the work, <laughs> which sounds so um, simple, but it was something that was needed for me and my artistic development to be able to say, okay, I can, I can do this. And then it wasn't, it was two more years before I called myself an artist. So I was at the, that point I was making art. I was starting to share art, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't identify fully as an artist. It was very like timid. I make art. And I see that a lot with uh, the interns and other art students that I uh, interact with. I have a lot of interns that I work with, uh, young women, and that's usually one of the biggest goals that I um, take on when working with them is, I want you to say that you're an artist, not an art student, right? right? You're so, already that. You're so it takes you, after that award, it takes you two years to where you com you're comfortable calling yourself yeah. an artist. Yeah. You've probably been an artist for 10 years, <laughs> 15 years before that. Yeah. What are those two years where you're not an artist <laughs> are they just more of I'm, the you know day in day out jobs they're uh me being in the studio at unc wilmington so i was an art major okay. and i was moving towards my career as an artist um but I, even then it was hard for me to say i am i don't know if it was because in my mind you have to get the degree or you have to reach this goal uh but or if it was just confidence, but it, that's, I was working. I was making art and I was still doing the jobs. And you know, if I had to bring my little girl with me, it was a pretty great space to do that. So if I had a ceramic class, there's a pottery wheel, I'm throwing bowls and she's making pinch pots or little caterpillars, which I still have in my studio. Um, and, and that's how we did it. And so I think that uh, by the time I got to my senior year, um, I was feeling more confident in my work because if there were opportunities at the university, I made time in my schedule to do it. I found a way. So I was, um, I did an internship through the un university gallery and then I um, was the arts editor for the creative magazine and then I moved to the creative director there. And um, so I anything I could do that would help me build skills and help connect me through the creative community even on campus was something that I I took very seriously. So you make the leap to where you're comfortable admitting that you're an artist. Yes. At this point. Do you does it create some conflict for you because we also the the world's perception of an art so now you've agreed to call right. yourself this artist but the world's perception is like oh she's starving like she's <laughs> she's homeless you know like my dad right, yeah. <laughs> was so worried yeah right so so what kind of conflict are you dealing with to where you find you know who you are but now you're dealing with the stigma that society puts on you i think that i am a gut person um i think that that's something intuition and and gut um, is something that I've, I've grown into and I continue focusing on. So I had to work very hard to kind of drown those voices out at times and go back to what do I personally know I can do in my life and what are my goals and, and how can I uh, perfect my field and work to get from here to here to here to here. And I think that comes down to, yes, you have to have talent. I, I was awarded a scholarship um, my senior year. That really helped because I thought, okay, these are people in the field that trust that I'm going to move forward. Um, but beyond that, it was making the commitment to work because you can have talent um, without the drive. And I, I think that's where I, I, I just committed to having the drive to do it. So, so now committing to a career as an artist, are you able, are you still working other jobs or are you, do you get to a point where you're like, nope, art's the only That way? happened two years ago. 
only okay. only two years only ago. two years ago so you know after graduation i um well during the, my senior year i met my husband mm -hmm. he lives in charlotte i was living in wilmington at the time um, so we became more serious and i relocated to the charlotte area and i started working at the mint museum uptown so i applied and got a job Again, I'm a foot in the door person, so I worked at guest services. I was the person selling tickets. And anytime there was uh, extra database work or an opportunity to volunteer at an event or support something, I was like, sign me up, I'll do it. Uh, and so at that point when someone went on maternity leave, I was put in temporarily to fill in in the fundraising and marketing department. Um, and then from there I was hired on as a full-time uh, person there. Um, in an assistant role. And so I had a wonderful uh, mentor and boss. Um, she's the director of advancement there. Her name's Hillary Cooper. And she was, she's, she loves artists. You're in a, luckily in a space, um, a creative space where uh, arts, arts are supported. And so I took vacation, my vacation days were me going and making installations at an art center or um, I worked a lot of, you know, even I'm also a mom at the time, so, so, so it's just like to, to get some income from your, your yeah, artistic endeavors. Some, but not enough for it to be sustainable. And the type of work that I do is is large scale installation work. So it's very uncommon, um, you know, at that stage for an artist that's working. It, and when I say large scale, I'm talking like, you know, ten feet by nine feet sculptures that are illuminated, temporary work. You know, that's not something that typically your client walks in. You're like, you know what, I'm going to I'm just going to pick that up and take that home and let's put that in my living room. So I had to examine, you know, I do that and I also do some two dimensional cut paper works. And so what my approach was is to um, create the series of works for walls or walls. And that's something that's approachable that people can take home with them, but also help me fund the work that I really love, not that I don't love my paperwork, but that really exploratory, conceptual, larger scale work. So what happens two years ago that you're like, this is paying the bills? <laughs> um, so it was a long road, right? Uh, we've talked about some of it, but I, I think there were some key things that uh, leading up to the two years that I'll mention quickly. So um, I went through uh, the Arts and Science Council in Charlotte. It's a great organization. They put out art calls. Um, it's also a great way to build your artist resume because when you, you know, my goal ultimately was to do public large scale works, but in order to, to do that, you really have to show um, that you have the experience, the capabilities, that you can manage a budget, all of these, these things. And that's not always talked about in art school. The business side of that is not talked about as much. How much did you like that part? Love it. Really? Yes. I love it. I'm such a planner. I, and I think that that's the other thing with, um, the work that I did when I talk about like taking the skills that you learn at each position along the way, don't take those for granted. When I worked in marketing and fundraising at the museum, I, I did event planning. I managed all of our ad budgeting and our deadlines. Um, I used a project management system. I did a ton of budgeting and spreadsheets. You treated it like a business. Right. And so in order for me to be successful with my public art goals, I needed to translate those skills and integrate that into my own business. And so that is where I think um, when, you're, when you're writing proposals and you're having to, to put together a budget or putting something in for a grant, those skills play a huge part in that because I think a lot of artists are not exposed to that out of the gate and it, it, I wasn't either. So it took a while to get well, there. That was my question. Yeah. How many talented artists do you come across that? They don't. They aren't. They're unable to make that leap because they can't grasp that business it's, side. It's either that they. Can, I think. I think people can. I think it's a. It's a choice. And I think there are also a lot of talented artists that where that isn't of interest to them, and so that they would perhaps go through more of, um, like a gallery model structure where there's a gallery there that's kind of facilitating the business side, yeah. and they're making and they're paying a service for the gallery to take that on. Um, there are pros and cons to that. For me, I like being what's called a free agent. I, I like having um, this, I like operating as a business and really being selective and um, intentional about the projects that I'm taking and, and how I approach that. And marketing, I have creative control. Um, can, can I ask this? Yeah. Uh, do you run across maybe less talented artists, but they're great at the business side? 
and they get a little bit more successful than their talent shows? Oh, that's a really, I feel like that's a hard question for another and artist to names answer. And uh, <laughs> URLs, yeah, no. I, I wouldn't say, so I think art is such a, um, it can be subjective, right? Oh, so it's, it's about taste, subjective. but I think there are, there are artists that, yes, um, they're pivoting and they're doing things really well, um, and they they're they're business people. So yeah, I mean, I wouldn't say it's less talented or more talented, but they're being effective in their approach to using the skills that they have to be successful and make a living. So while you talk about people, uh, other artists pivot based on what is in their strengths, whether it's on the business side or the uh, the medium in which they, they express their artistic uh, endeavors, you have gone on to a more technology-based side using lights and incorporating those into your, into your work. How did that come to be? Well, um, that's really, that project, Lights, was at the U.S. National Whitewater Center, um, and we opened in 2019, I believe, uh, was the first year. And that was when you asked me earlier about what was the project that kind of launched uh, being a full-time artist, that was the project. So that was my uh, first public project, and I went from doing installations indoors, uh, mostly one at a time, at museums, galleries, art centers, things like that, to uh, bridging to 15 large-scale installations outside on a half a mile trail. Um, and, you know, I'm inspired by science, nature, and technology. So the technology piece has always been there. It's a very foundational part of my process, uh, but also nature and science play a huge role in that. And I think that that project was, it was extremely special for me. Uh, creatively uh, for a variety of reasons, but being able to really um, explore the landscape and create uh, work that is inspired by the landscape there was uh, was interesting. And then bringing the science piece in, um, you know, I wired all the lighting. I was working with their electricians to upfit for um, all the electricity that was needed because there was nothing out there when we started. So that that was interesting as well. And again builds a skill set that I didn't have. I mean, I had some of it, but it builds upon that a lot. And, and does that help you start pivoting to where you think going forward, I want to play in this space a lot more than what I Yes, yeah. yeah. I mean, it, it was always there for me. It was always, um, you know, it's that old saying, it takes one to get one, right? right? You know, most of the time when you're uh, pitching for a public art project, they want to see that you know how to do it and that you've done it before. Right. This was a very um, special opportunity where the center had not done visual art to that scale. They'd had film series and music, but nothing visual or immersive. And I had done visual and immersive indoors, but not outdoors. And and you know we we talked through it. Um, I had I had three meetings. It started with a cup of coffee. And it ended with a meeting with their CEO, their director of special events, and the director of marketing. And they said, "All right, well, get us a get us a budget and get us a pitch." And then that's where some of those skills um, from my past business experience came into play because that didn't that didn't overwhelm me. And if there were things that didn't um, I didn't fully grasp or hadn't fully done research, I think that's something people take for granted too. You have resources, you can figure it out, yeah. right? Well, so you end up winning the bid. Right. How <laughs> how good does that that win feel? I cried. Right. I cried. Yeah, and I I cried probably twice or three yeah. times <laughs> to my husband. I was like, I can't believe this. This is amazing. And then of course there's the moment of like, oh my gosh. I've got to do now it. Now I've got to do it now, yeah. right? And there's a timeline and uh, but I think that that you know, for me it was it's never a lack of concept or ideas, it's right. the resources. Right. And so it also was and execution. such- execution. Execution, yeah. And that's where I think um, for me, that organizational project management side comes into play because we had three months to make um, 15 installations that had nearly 300 individual objects. Right. So it was the game plan. And you know, how do I delegate? I need to hire a team to help support that. and. Um, take it in baby steps and, and get it done. That I'm assuming that's the the tipping point where you're like, 
I am now a full-time artist. This is how I make a living. Yes. And over the course of the last two years, you've, you've had other projects. Yes. You're able to you're able to make a living off of this. You're you're not starving. Yeah. I'm assuming you're I'm not, not the starving yeah. artist we all assume yeah. to be. And now you have a, a new venture yes. that has just started. Yes. What? But tell us about that and what what pivot happened for that to come to be? Well, so as you said, yes. So as you said, I have other projects coming. Um, I'm booked actually until 2023, which is insane. And I call that like my pipeline. It makes me feel very salesy. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> um, but beyond that, I have a very close friend that I connected with when I first started working at the museum. She's brilliant. Her name is Katie Cosie Miller. And she has been in uh, fundraising for, you know, 10, 10 plus years. Uh, and she's also an artist and a maker. And, you know, for years we started talking. Uh, we just have our normal, our art talks, our friendship and um, things that we're passionate about. And, and one of those things, one of the biggest things for us is supporting artists and makers and uh, making sure that uh, just from the different experiences I've come across that they're getting um, the majority of their investment investment from customers and that their work is valued uh, and so that can even come into play also when you think about what art is functional and non-functional and so from those conversations um, something ignited and that idea uh, became our new business called ash and ochre and ash and ochre uh, we offer small batch craft and wares for your sacred space and home. That's our that's our pitch. Um, we launched this past Sunday, and so we launched with 15 artists, and we have ceramics, woodwork, fiber work, um, and traditional all, uh, contemporary. All brick and mortar. So before we move into a brick and mortar, we really wanted to create a community and a customer base, and really um, build our inventory, and also really get to know our customers who they are, where they're, where they're located. And, you know, right now, the, the reason that we can really support the makers um, with the percentage that we are supporting, so they get 70% of their sale. Um, Which compared to other uh, So when you're dealing with, uh, with galleries and in, in those spaces, and there is a space for galleries, we need them, they're amazing. Uh, but this is something different. Uh, they're, they're usually taking like 50% or more. Um, and so what that also can do is a lot of times artists are then um, adding on that commission price in order to make sure that they're getting their, their portion. And so from my perspective and Katie's perspective, that also makes art in the home less accessible for certain demographics. And so we're really trying to kind of fill a space to uh, connect makers um, to uh, to their people and for people to live with the art and for people to use the art because it doesn't art doesn't have to be a picture on a wall we have some beautiful ceramic work by um, Aaron Wilcox he's a professor at UNC Wilmington and he said he said they're pots for use he wants that to be something that you use and I think in our culture there is this instant gratification this um, need to like and again there's nothing wrong with this like run into a store grab what you need, oh, it's in style, move on. Uh, this is not, the work we have, that's not what this is. This is all handmade uh, with a lot of care. And so it's something that really can be in your home for a very long time, handed down to your kids. It's it's special. And it's something you purchase after it moves you, not because you were looking for right, it. Right, right. It's something where it's, it's almost waiting for the right person. And we really like that. With, with the type of uh, art that you, you're dealing with, I'm sure challenges, I, you can't get the full perspective over e-retail um, of how magnificent it right. is. So how do you overcome some of those challenges? I think it's really, um, that's something that we, we talk about and we're still new business, but as we planned our marketing plan and our, our conversations about, about that, like the, you know, our, our premise is really in service to the artists. So how can we um, overcome that? And I think it's, first of all, allowing the, um, the consumer, the customer to get to know the artist, not just their work. So really sharing their story. I think video is really great in kind of doing that. And then, you know, once the pandemic um, kind of passes 
uh, a bit and we get a little more open, we'll be doing pop-ups and have opportunities for that first-hand interaction along with workshops and, and things of that nature. So those are all on the, on the list of goals. Looking back on your path to making a living as an artist, is there anything you wish you could undo or something you wish you would have known ahead of time that you, things you made a big deal out of that you shouldn't have or things that somebody should have told me this, this was a disaster? <laughs> <laughs> I think it would, uh, for me, um, gosh, that's a really good question. Uh, I think it's more uh, operate as a business sooner would be my thing because I think you know, there was a time where it was like, I was so invigorated and so excited. It was that like, I'll pay you to take this. <laughs> Just, I'm so excited you're interested. And I think that knowing your, if I could say anything to my younger self, it's, it's know your worth and, um, and go at it a little bit harder, a little bit sooner. Is there any piece that you gave away or gave away at a steal that you still keeps you up at night? Mm, no, no. Um, there, well, maybe there's one piece okay. <laughs> now that I think about it. It's not that it keeps me up at night, but uh, it was a piece and it was my first piece that I ever sold that was an installation sculpture. And I think I sold it for like $500. Um, now at the time that was like, oh my gosh, I just paid my studio rent right. and that's amazing. Uh, but you know, I think that as artists begin, um, you really need to understand your, your value because when you start selling, that also dictates your point of sale. And it's, so it's a little bit harder to increase if you've already started selling at a certain price point. So really, I think researching and looking at um, what other work of that scale is selling for. Also, there's some variables in terms of, all right, has this been, person been doing this for 20 years? Are they really established? But, but I think, you know, that that was not a $500 sculpture. It was 150 feet of lighting. <laughs> so uh, real quick on that side, you're kind of doing some of the accounting pieces of it. Like this is how many hours it'll take me. This is how much I bill out an hour. Like you get to that yeah. point. Yeah. And I think that that's something that's really important um, for artists. And, and another thing I would say is, you know, automating what you can. There are a lot of resources out there. If you, you know, operate as a sole proprietor, you can, you can get, something to track all of that for you, like through a QuickBooks um, that makes it really easy because I wasn't maximizing my materials and, and deductions. Even as an art student, you don't have to have, you could have $500 profit and still have deducted a lot. So I think that's something that um, isn't, again, like talked about. But yeah, now I'm very, um, you know, I kind of have my, my formula and it's really, I approach it almost like a, a construction project or a home renovation, right? There's labor, there's materials, there's design, um, and then there's project management and implementation. And all of that plays a role in the fee. And I think when you're working with a customer um, where they may not fully grasp all that goes into creating something, it's almost like, oh, there's a magic wand, you've, you've made this, right? It's really helpful to share that with your your customer so that they also understand that you're serious and that this is why the price point is where it is. How much would you charge today for that $500 project if you were to do it? Oh God, if it was permanent? Yeah. Oh man, um, it would be, I would be a little more well-made, but yeah. I, it would probably be, uh, probably be a $25,000 sculpture now. So yeah. It's some great perspective on yeah. everything that you've learned. Yeah. Um, well, thank you so You're much for, for being on. That. It's honestly a, a great point to end on. Uh, thank you so much yeah, for your time. Thank you. And this was so fun. Yeah, yeah, it, it, really great. So Thanks for watching. Make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel at youtube.com slash nexageeducation or visit kazmaward.com to catch up on previous episodes. And be on the lookout for our next episode featuring Alex Smirznak. Alex is the co-founder of 2U Laundry. 2U Laundry is a laundry service founded in 2016 that has grown exponentially in employees and customers over the years.